Welcome back to the Bernard Lee Poker Show. This month-long celebration of uh, Women's National History Month, of course, has been brought to you by the Poker League of Nations. Uh, Plon, better known, of PokerLeagueOfNations.com. It is the world's largest and most internationally represented women's poker organization. Go to PokerLeagueOfNations.com to join free. Over 7,500 members, and there is a lot of free content, educational content. Uh, I was fortunate to help out. And also, this guest this week is another person who has contributed so much not only to Poker League of Nations, but to the world of poker. Linda Johnson is not only a inaugural member of the Women's Poker Hall of Fame, but the Poker Hall of Fame. She is a WSOP bracelet winner, former card player, magazine publisher. She is part of the TDA, part of PokerGives.org. She is the owner of Card Player Cruises. By the way, if I keep going on, the whole hour will be over. There's so many things this woman has done for the world of poker. And that's why Mike Sexton, the ambassador of poker, named her the first lady of poker. So pleased to have back on the show, Linda Johnson. Linda, thanks for joining us here once again on the Bernard Lee Poker Show. Thank you, Bernard. Man, I wish my mom was here to hear that introduction. She'd have been so proud. <laughs> I'll send her the link. One correction, though. Um, I am not the only owner. Uh, I have some business partners that own Card Player Cruises, Mark and Tina Napolitano and Jan Fisher. So we're all co-owners. Co-owners. Sorry about that. But uh, it is it is incredible what you have done for the world of poker. And this Women's Month celebration would not be complete if I didn't have you on. Uh, so I'm so pleased that you're able to join us and, and talk about your history of poker and, and really the memories from the, the days when you started, the card player initial days, and then also, of course, your great friendship with Mike Sexton. So there's so much to talk about. I'm hoping well, we're going to jam pack it in this hour. <laughs> thanks so, for uh, recognizing women this month, especially you do, you do all the time, but uh, I know this is national women's month and you're taking, uh, you've been interviewing a lot of women and, and we appreciate it. Well, I, as I've said many times, if there's a segment of the market that we can grow, that we don't have, all we have to do is increase the women's population and market segment in poker. I mean, there's 50% of the market that's just untapped. When you have less than 5% of a field in a tournament that is less than 5% is women. I mean, you just increase that by a little bit. And now the player pools will go up, the prize pools, et cetera. So I really feel like there is a great opportunity. And if I can do a little part of uh, bringing that world uh, to my listeners. Hopefully it'll, it'll increase the uh, interest and just to get a few more players, what would it hurt? It wouldn't hurt anything. And I think it'd yeah. be great. And, as, uh, as you said, women are the untapped market and, and uh, right? so many women that if we could just get them into poker, you know, uh, they would, they would continue to play and, and, and it's, it would open the numbers in, tremendously. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, we talk, we've talked about it. I mentioned it before, you know, obviously Chris Moneymaker did what he did for his boom. And then Black Friday, the negative effect for the U.S., but the positive effect was outside the U.S. It, it, the, the world of poker boomed outside the U.S. And I still think that there's, like we said, an untapped market of, of women that we can grow. And so that's why I decided to have this national month, especially since we've already had, we had Lena on, who is the uh, founder of Plon, but also two big winners of the WSOP women's event, Laura Eisenberg, and also Kinda England, who won the MSPT. But you of course, have such a robust history in the world of poker, uh, winning your bracelet and also being a member of the Hall of Fame. Let's kind of go back. How did you get started in the world of poker? Because as we talked about, think of it today, how few women play. Back when you did it, I mean, it, it, it is that much um, fewer uh, players who were women. How did you kind of get into the world of poker? 
Well, it's interesting because most poker players who uh, turn pro started at a young age. I did not. Uh, I was 21 before I uh, learned about poker, played my first hand. And what happened was um, I was going to Las Vegas and playing blackjack as soon as I turned 21. And my dad uh, was a very good poker player and he had supplemented his uh, military income by, by poker games, private poker games. And so he said, Linda, you can't beat the house, you know, don't play 21. If you want to learn how to gamble and make money, you need to learn how to play poker because, wow. you know, as long as you play um, better than most of the players at the table, you have a very good chance of winning for that day and you will win in the long run. And so uh, at the time I was working at the post office and I went out and bought myself a book on how to play poker. And I learned from a book and then I started playing with the guys at work um, and they were real nice in the beginning when I was a sucker, but once I got to be a little <laughs> bit better, it was like, oh, we don't want them to play anymore. And so right. I was living in Southern California at the time and we had some card rooms in Gardena. The only games that were legal back then, believe it or not, were five card draw high and five card draw low. And so I started going out there and it was really miserable there for women. I mean, the people were just nasty. And uh, so I started going to Las Vegas on my weekends. It was a four hour drive from uh, Long Beach to, I was living in Southern California, four hour drive to Las Vegas. And I would drive up on my day off and play for two days and then come home. And I loved it from the beginning. I, uh, you know, a lot of people say, if you're gonna be a poker player, you're gonna to have to go broke at some point or many times. And, and for me, that wasn't the case. I, I was pretty much successful after my initial month or two uh, I became a winning player, and uh, back then we only had a couple books on poker. It's not like today. Right. Like my bookcase here. These are all right. poker books, and 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 it goes wider too. Um, yeah. But back then there was like three books, and so I bought them and I devoured them, and and I you know I just always say that people have a niche for something, and for me it was for poker. Yeah. So, like you said. Back then, very few books to um, learn about poker. And also what's uh, what's great about from your standpoint is that your father encouraged you. That's definitely one thing um, uh, Laura mentioned in her interview that, you know, most women and young girls aren't exposed to poker right away. You know, boys, hey, let's get together in high school right. and go down to the basement and play poker. That's definitely not something that is very commonplace among young girls. And it's great that your father encouraged you, obviously, uh, to, to play. Um, how proud of he was he of you when you started beating the boys? Oh, he was very proud. But uh, <laughs> it's kind of funny because my mom did not want me to be a poker I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure. Two of them argued about it. But dad would uh, take me aside and say, this is... You, you can do this. This is you're going to be good at this, and and he was right. He was very proud. I wish he had lived long enough to see some of the honors uh, and trophies and and bracelet and stuff that I won. Um, but I do remember at my very first poker tournament where he was he came to watch me. I made the final table, and I and he had been on the rail the whole time. And I turn around, and, I, and my dad isn't there, and I'm like, what the heck? Anyway, he picked that time to go get a shoe shine, and so. <laughs> <laughs> I came in like third or fourth in that tournament, but the whole time I was wondering, where's dad, you know, but yes, he was very proud of me. You know, in today's world, No Limit Hold'em obviously is king ever since Chris Moneymaker, but back then that wasn't the case at all. No Limit Hold'em really wasn't played much except at the World Series, but it was a lot of mixed games, obviously a lot more limit. What games were, you know, really big for you? Um, personally, I liked uh, seven card stud mm -hmm. and we also played six card stud. Oh, really? And, yeah, that was six card stud was probably more popular when I first moved to Las Vegas in 1980 than seven card stud. So and, how was six um, card stud played? Is it one down, four up, one down or, how, or, or two down, three? How is it down, played? Three up, one down. Yeah. Got it. Oh, interesting. Uh -huh. And uh, I, I really liked that game. And they also played Raz. And, mm -hmm. um, and that was the game that I, I learned to love is Raz. But Hold'em um, hold really only became popular in the mid 80s. And as you said, it was all limit Hold'em. You could not find a cash no limit game at any time in Las Vegas other than during the, back then it was like two and a half weeks of uh, right. the World Series. But there was no, 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 no limit cash games available. And you right. know what? Probably better for poker. 
because you mm -hmm. could come here with a hundred dollars and not go broke in one hand. And, right. you know, so people played a lot longer and the, the card rooms did well to have players playing longer. And so it, it was a good atmosphere. You know, when, when back in the nineties, when Foxwoods first opened up in 92, me and a buddy would go down there and play. And I was a seven card stud guy. I, I got Doyle's book, Super System, read Chip Reese's chapter from start to finish, highlighted in three different colors, had the index cards, looking at my notes as we're driving down. I'm not driving, he's driving down. And he would also go play, but he played this weird game and had these community cards and you only got dealt two cards and he called it Texas Hold'em. I said, yep. what in the world is Texas Hold'em? And of course it was limit at the time. Um, and, and still, even after Chris Moneymaker did what he did, no limit Hold'em was not something that all card rooms believed that it could be sustainable. I remember calling a couple local rooms and saying, hey, listen, you know, out in California, they're doing this. They're playing this one, two, one, three, two, five, whatever. And they said, nah, it's not going to sustain. Obviously, we now know that's like the lifeblood of every poker room right now. No limit right. hold'em. Um, but, but you know, players really would be better off if they didn't offer no limit, if everything was limit, um, especially the low limit players, you know. Um, I, I hate to see someone, you know, bring their bankroll uh, to the card room and go broke in one hand. Exactly. And, uh, that's why it was not encouraged by card rooms because obviously they make money the longer people play. So it's not necessarily good for players to play no limit. When I teach people like on the cruises, um, when I teach them to play, I teach them to play limit hold them so that if they buy in for a hundred dollars, they can play for, you know, a, a couple hours. Right, 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 right. And that's, uh, I, I did some limit work, uh, mixed game up here in the New England area as well. And I just love I for me, I, I love my big thing is, as I've talked to a lot of people about mixed games is deuce to seven. I like the no limit version and the triple draw, but still stud to me is, is that's why I grew up playing. It's very funny how people talk about that. They, a lot of people, for some reason, find stud high, a very difficult game. And I find it very easy because it was the first game I ever played, right? I mean, that's what I know. I actually find stud high, low a lot harder. I, I've played it enough now, but much harder to be accustomed to than stud high. Whereas a lot of people who play mixed games, they do play the you know high, low versions. So they find stud high very, very difficult. And I, I just find that pretty funny uh, coming from my background, obviously. Well, you need a good memory in uh, in stud high, well, stud yeah. high low as well. Uh, whereas in Omaha, uh, Hold'em in Omaha, you don't need any right. memory because it's all common cards. Right, right, exactly, exactly. That's why people have trouble with it, I think. Yeah, yeah, and I, I guess it's just something you just get used to, right? And it's funny, during my home games, a lot of times, the first round, everyone's just flicking in bets, just call, 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 whatever. And I'll always stop and I'll look around and people are like, what are you waiting for? I'm like, well, I'm kind of looking at what cards are out. <laughs> I know you are going to do that, but I kind of do that, right? And so like when you're trying to play low and there's two twos and three threes out and you look down and you have two three, you have a great hand. I mean, yes. because now you're not going to pair them low no. and, you know, it's as, as good of a starting a scenario as it could be. But if there's two twos and three threes and you have five, seven, not too great, you know? So uh, I don't think it's just the fun of, of stud, obviously. Yeah. Um, and one, you, one reason it's fun to play is because a lot of people don't play it well. Right. I mean, a lot of people, you know, let's say you're playing stud and they see, uh, you know, a ace jack four and they might think that's a playable hand or if they're playing a high low, they might think it's a playable hand. Right. So people like to get in action and when they have three cards, quite often two of them are, are good. Exactly. And they play exactly. And they go with it. Right, so. right. That, that's like Omaha, right? I got four cards. Once I see three cards, I mean, it's almost impossible for it not to connect somehow. Yeah. And so you're just going to be drawn in the whole way. And, and it's like, no one's ever folding. I mean, that, how is that ever going to happen? You know, in I remember so. playing with one lady and she'd say things like, oh man, I, I've got two straight flush draws when she'd have four or five of clubs and the Jack 10 of clubs in Omaha high low. Right, oh, right. Right. <laughs>
yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. You do have two draws. <laughs> um, for her, because you know, people always talk about wraparounds, right? Right. Uh, wraparound right. Straight, which means that you have, you know, the world's fair to draw to. So many outs. No matter what kind of straight she had, she'd say, "I have a wraparound," even if it was a gut shot straight. <laughs> And so we got to call her Saran Wrap was her nickname. <laughs> That's great. That's awesome. I mean, you have there are a lot of people. We've had some people that you know they they'll say, "Oh, I was on a draw," but you were on a draw by the last card. You weren't really on a draw. So let's be honest. You won your bracelet in Raz in 1997. Um, how you know we look at it today, where if a woman wins an open event, it's a big deal. It's a pretty big deal. How was it back in 97? Was it was it really publicized? Or was it like, eh, they weren't really talking about it because poker wasn't as huge as it was today? No, for, uh, for a woman for me to win uh, back in 1997 was huge, you I'm know, sure. made headlines. And, uh, you know, there was it was funny because at my final table, uh, back then they had bleachers around the final table right. when it was at Binion's. And usually there'd be, you know, five or six people in the bleachers. But when I walked in that day, there were, you know, standing room only. All the bleachers were full. People had signs saying, go Linda. That's you know, awesome. They, they actually were wearing hats that said, go Linda. So it was a big deal. But I don't That's... know. I don't know if I ever told you the story about what happened after I won it. Did I tell you? No, about no. It? Tell me. Tell me problem with the record keeping. So right after I won it, uh, the headlines were like second woman in history wins, wins World Series bracelet. Yeah. And I said, wait a minute, I'm the third person because I was there when Vera Richmond won it. And I was there when Barbara Enright won it. Right. So why is it saying second woman in history? And I went to, uh, you know, the people in charge and, and I said, why isn't Vera's name in the record book? And they said, well, she was a bitch. Okay. Oh. So oh my God. now, don't get me wrong. She was nasty. But still, <laughs> but that doesn't, I said, that doesn't you know what? It doesn't matter. I said, there's right. plenty of asshole men in the, in the, in the record book. And, you right, know, right. Her name in. and it right. took a couple years, but they got her name uh, put in. That is something else. It's a true story, Bernard. <laughs> that is something else. That's like, say, I mean, listen, that's like saying, you know, for better or worse, I'm not, it's, it's the full tilt scandal, right? So it's like saying Howard Letterer and Chris Ferguson has just erased their name from the, I mean, it, the history is a history. Russ Hamilton, the history is a history, right? You can't like, it, just because of their personality, that's something else. Yeah. Now, was, she was mean and she was ornery and she right, right. could cuss. You're not, dis you. you're not disputing that part of it. I'm it's not just that. that but, she, but she still deserved to be in the record book because she right. did you know? Right, right. It is what it is. <laughs> um, I would lo love to um, have you describe kind of the world that you lived in for several years as card player publisher. Um, um, I know that it kind of stemmed from your love of the cruises, and obviously you still do the cruises, but you love the cruises, approached the current or, or at the time the owners of card player, and they were interested in selling the whole not only the magazine, but the cruises. How was that kind of, because at the time you had no experience running a magazine, right? That's correct. I was a professional poker player and my friends were professional poker players. So what happened was my fiance, uh, Scott Rogers and Denny Axel and I went on the first ever poker uh, card player poker cruise. And yep. we had so much fun as we were sitting around waiting to get uh, off the ship. We said, man, we need to go and talk to June and Phil Field and see if we can somehow play a part in future cruises because we didn't want to ever miss another one. So yeah. we went and talked to them and they were elderly at the time around in their 70s. And they they had worked so hard. Um, Card Player Magazine had been in existence for a couple of years. And, and uh, then they put everything into this cruise that was very successful for them. And they retired and they said, you know what? You can buy the whole thing if you want. And so we, we didn't have the money to buy it, but we went to a venture capitalist and the, um, Debbie Stone invested in the magazine, bought it and we ran it and we used our, um, our labor as sweat equity. And, but it was funny, we had a saying, fake it till you make it because we were literally flying by the seat of our pants. Now, <laughs> luckily Phil and June, we, uh, part of the agreement, sales agreement was that they stay for six months to teach us how to run a magazine. As you said, we knew nothing about a magazine. You know, yeah. I, I had taken English classes in college and I was pretty good at editing and writing, but 
uh, as far as the actual production of magazine, we knew nothing. So it was uh, very time consuming. I would say we worked probably um, 12 hours a day, seven days a week to put out a publication. When we, um, when we bought it, it was a 32 page rag, which means it was a black and white print. Uh, right. And uh, we turned it into a full uh, glossy uh, four color magazine. And by the time we sold it eight years later, it was 132 pages all glossy. Wow. Wow. But we were very lucky because the timing was right. Uh, we bought it in, in 92. We took ownership uh, April Fool's Day, 1993. And right about then, uh, card rooms started to open. Uh, when we bought it, there was only legal poker on the West Coast in uh, mm -hmm. Oregon and Washington and California, <clears throat> and Nevada, of course. But um, pretty soon it opened up, Foxwoods opened up. And, right, and, uh, right, 92. You know, up and down the coast and everywhere. And so we had uh, all these big card rooms that wanted to uh, buy ads, but they didn't want to buy ads in, a, in an ugly newsprint magazine. Right. So right. we had to make that tough decision to turn it into a glossy magazine so that we could attract all the advertisers. But it was scary because, you know, we had our first year, we made like $2,500 and, and going glossy was going to add 100000 to our print bill. And I was like so concerned about it. And my partners were absolutely right. Penny and Scott said, if you build it, they will come. And right. so we took the move and pretty soon uh, it became very, very successful. I mean, you in indirectly had so much to do with my career, I guess, because <clears throat> when you took over in 93, that's right around the time when I was playing a lot at Foxwoods in Atlantic City and et cetera. And, you know, anytime you're there, what do you do? You grab you grab the magazine. Right. And so I would grab a magazine and bring it home. And I still remember you know, looking through it, reading the magazines. And then also at the back, they would have those, okay, these, these are the final tables for this. So if the World Poker Finals had events, they had all the events and they had all the names on there and they had pictures of some of the winners, sometimes all the winners. And I, I still remember it. I'm really being serious. I remember sitting there probably sitting on the toilet because right because it's good to have a magazine but anyway it was always there but sitting there saying I'm going to be in there one day I didn't mean like the picture or anything like that I'm going to be in there one day I'm going to be on that final table and one day that I'm going to be able to say like hey that's me and so it was really something when back in I think when I first started writing for card player it was like 2010 2011 something like that, about 10 years ago and i've written i still I, I currently write for them right now but i still remember being like this is surreal mm -hmm. that you know about a decade ago more than a decade ago right it was in the 90s two decades ago i was reading this saying i'm going to be in there one day and now i'm writing a column a regular column in there and it's crazy you know and and that's the the fun so you know indirectly i don't know if i ever told you that but indirectly it's like you had a, an influence on me playing poker because i uh, that magazine was such a big deal back then i mean it was really the magazine back in, uh, in the uh in the 90s uh to, that every card room like you said you you just saw them and you just grab one you would sit there and read it that's a cool story. And I think a lot of people, um, uh, you know, really learned a lot through Card Player Magazine and um, aspired to uh, get into the magazine. You know, I, I remember when I would uh, approach someone to, we used to have columns, um, you know, getting to know somebody. Right. You know, and then we, and everybody was so excited. And, you know, I want to do that. I want to be in it. And right. it was the only publication at the time, the only poker publication, and it was nationwide. And, um, you know, it, I had so much fun as the publisher slash owner. I got to travel to uh, probably about a hundred card rooms throughout uh, while I owned it. And, and uh, you know, it was fun. We, I, I like to play poker, as you know, but there was so much editing to do. So, I would talk to different card room managers here in Las Vegas and uh, ask them if, do you mind if I edit while I play? And they, they <laughs> no problem, do it. You know, even though some of them had rules against reading at the table, you know, they right. said, well, you're not really reading, you're editing. And, you know, so uh, people got used to, locals got used to seeing me editing paperwork while I'm playing poker. 
That's funny. You know, think about today, right? What everyone's just on their phones and like, oh, yeah. you can't read. Yeah. 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 That's funny. Well, I well, imagine we, today it's a lot easier. You know, we did everything manually. You know, we sure. put the boards up, we did everything. And I'm sure today uh, that it's it's a lot more um, tech, tech, technology, right. a lot more technology involved in printing a magazine. Sure, sure. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk more with Linda about her incredible career, Car Player Cruises, WPT, of course, her good friendship with Mike Sexton, too, when we return here on the Bernard Lee Poker Show.